Good morning. Good morning, Coastline Golf Breeze. Wow, did he say 88? <sighs> well, great, fantastic, wonderful to, to be with you guys. Greetings, uh, greetings to you from that faraway land and church in Navari. That's what they call it when you're not from around here. Navari. Yeah, it's beautiful to be here. Uh, before we, we jump in to the message this morning, let me first, let me first just tell you what an honor it is to, to actually uh, be back here uh, to be with you this morning. This is my home church. Uh, this, is, this is one of the sending churches along with Coastline Destin that sent myself and my, my beautiful wife, Dawn, I think there's a picture of my family, uh, Don and my three boys it sent us to uh, to all the way down to Navarre, where we uh, where we planted. I want to say it was a little over five years ago, five and a half years ago. Uh, so for some of you, we go way way back. We go ten years, twenty years, twenty twenty five. We go long ways back with uh, with uh, my I do and my wife and I do with some of you guys. But I come here on vacations and I'll sneak in and and uh, and be a part of the fellowship like like you are, just kind of participating and and uh, I recognize that. I don't recognize a lot of you. Like, there are so many new families, which is a good thing. There's so many new families that are here. So I thought, before I jump in, in the message, maybe I'll share just a little bit about, a little bit about my, myself uh, with you guys. Uh, I am a son of a son of a local, right? Like, like the Spencers, kind of rare breed in these in these uh, neck of the woods here. Born in Pensacola, raised in Gulf Breeze. I was a uh, hell-raising surfer back in 1991. Uh, Yancey, you can attest to that. Um, God then used, used this church in such powerful ways to, to shape me and to grow me in my faith. A new life New Life Church was just this small little church. It was actually a metal building back in the woods. Kind of freaked me out at first, right? Not off the way off the beaten path, not on some main road, and uh, and it was just a small church. It was probably 125, 150 people with kids at the time, and uh, it was my family. It became my family. My my mom and dad they weren't following the Lord, um, and so this little church became became my family. Neil was just a little tyke. I think he was like nine or nine or ten, uh, just a little dude. And I was privileged to sit under Pastor John's verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter uh, teaching, uh, New Testaments on Sunday morning, Old Testaments on Wednesday night, very faithful and consistent year after year after year. And I was privileged to that, and many of you have been and still are privileged to have that verse-by-verse teaching. Uh, I was discipled here by two uh, by two men in the church. One was an elder by the name of Roger Kraft. Another was a youth pastor by the name of Roger Jan. And uh, they opened their homes up to me, my, and they became my family within the family here and uh, taught me how to live out this word. And just teach it by instruction, but showed me how to, um, how to live it out. I'm forever grateful uh, for God's work in this church through through those guys. Um, I came on as an intern right after Bible college. Probably Joe Pressures had been here on staff for a couple of months at the time. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure he can tell you some fun stories. I'll let him do that. Uh, I'm sure I was a pain in the butt. But uh, Pastor John later, later married me and Don. And we both served on staff here in multiple capacities. My wife were about five years and myself for about 10 years, and it dedicated all three of these boys that, that was on the screen, all three of the boys, two of them right here, and one of them at a beach baptism. And uh, so that being said, I, I owe a great deal to this work of God, to this amazing work of God, and um, I'm gaining more and more respect for Pastor John every year that I, I lead as a, a lead pastor of a fellowship. Uh, that is for sure. Happy birthday, Pastor John. 
Thank you for your, your continued work. And, uh, and, and for this, I, I repeat, I'm honored to share here with you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much, guys, for, for receiving me. Now, the passage that I, I want to share with you is from the Psalms, as was mentioned, Psalm 121. It's not what I originally, what I initially had in mind when I was going to come and, and share, but in surveying the, the social climate of our time, I'm ever pressed to bring you certainty in times of uncertainty, to bring you encouragement in times of discouragement, and hope in a time when hope is either sparse or sought after in all the wrong places. So please stand with me, little Calvary Stenics, stand with me and turn, if you haven't already, to Psalm 121, and your Bibles are your Bible apps. And uh, I'll be teaching from the New Living Translation this morning. Uh, so if you're there, I want you to read along with me. Psalm 121, I look to the mountains. Does my help come from, from there? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. Though the one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and you go, both now and forever. Pray with me. Father God, in Jesus' name, we, we bow our hearts to you. Lord God, thank you. Thank you that we can, we can pull away from the, 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 the craziness of life, the, 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 the world outside those doors, the, even the world in our own minds and hearts, the, the things that we're dealing with in our own life, decisions that we're having to, to make our own sin that we're dealing with, the sin of others upon us. Lord, thank you that we can gather together as a church, as we can worship you with our song and with our tongues, that we can worship you, Lord, with our giving of time, talent, and treasure. We can worship you in fellowship, and we can worship you in the reading and studying of your word. Thank you, Lord, for this. And I pray this morning as... We sung of your presence being powerful amongst us. I pray, Lord, that you would by your spirit lead, guide, and teach us. May my words fall by the wayside. May your word, may your word ring powerfully true in our minds and hearts, and may we be aware of your presence this morning. Walk us through the word. Instruct, encourage, and convict us, Lord, where we need those things. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated. You know, this, this life is, is full of problems. It's, it's full of, of sorrow. It's full of hurt. And Jesus, he, he, he grabbed his disciples and he's instructing them and he told his disciples, and he really, he, te he tells us that here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. And no one's exempt from them. Everyone has to face them. It's just this simple given in this fallen world that man messed up. Not God. Man messed this world up. He created it perfect and it was good. We sinned, we corrupted, we bring such great pain and suffering. And it's a given that we're going to experience in this, in this fallen world. We, today, as we look around, we, we face economic instability, we, we face social unrest, moral decay, declining health. And it seems like this never-ending fear of pandemic. Never-ending. It's not going to ever end. Stop, just get down, Randy. Stop. Just stop right now, right? 
And we can, we can argue the, the narrative, you and I, we can argue with others the narrative concerning pandemic. Is it really a pandemic? We can argue back and forth and we can argue on, on, on the ecological concerns. Is there really global warming? No, there's not. And there, we can argue about that all day long. But the reality is it doesn't change the concern or the stress that a vast majority of people in our nation have and our world beyond. In 2020, the APA reported more than three in four adults, 77% say the future of our nation is a significant source of stress in their life. 11% up from 2019. I mean, since the Civil War, America has, has never been so divided. And never has our government, the media, and even our medical community been so untrusted. Never. Never in the, in the past. We do not know what to believe, who to believe, who to trust, do we? Oh, but we can trust everything that's on Facebook, right? <laughs> because it's, the truth is screened, right? We can, so we can trust everything on Facebook. Hmm. Okay, so thanks, Pastor Randy. You've painted this picture. You've you stated the obvious uh, that we're under duress, that, that we're surrounded by, by trouble, let me ask you this question. Where does your help come from? Does it, does it come from a vaccine, guys? It's going to change. Next year, I have to get another one and another one and another one. And, and it's to, does it come in the form of a vaccine? Does it come from economic stability? Does it come from a political party or a political leader? Does, does it come from, and this is a hard one, not come from a military community, guys. Most of my churches, military and retired military, does it come from a military security? No. Does it, does it come from the planet's health? Healthy planet? No. The psalmist said that his help comes from the Lord. His help comes from the Lord who made heaven and the earth. And, and as we, as is this guy, this psalmist, would, would make his way to Jerusalem because this was a psalm of, of ascent. Like pilgrims three times a year would make their way, 18 and older men would make their way to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. And, and as they approached Jerusalem, from wherever they were coming from all over the world, as they approach it, they would look up at, to, to Mount Zion, right? To the place where the Lord would meet with man. And they would sing this psalm, right? This is where my, I look to the mountain, this is where my trust will come from it as they, the man would meet with God in the, in the temple. They would, they would recognize him. He would, he would meet with them, right? It's a powerful understanding of where, where his help would, would come from. So, so no matter what problem he would be carrying, this pilgrim, whether it was domestic or foreign, no matter what his, his concern, no matter what his trouble, no matter what his, his, his problem, he knew that help, well, it came from the Lord. And that place of worship was where he would, we would meet and he would lay everything down and the Lord would meet him. And since God, since Yahweh made all things, those, those things that couldn't be seen in the heavens, those things that he depended upon, that we depend upon on this earth, since the Lord made all things, he knew that God could help him, that God was his, his help. And, and you and I should, should have an even greater hope, a greater hope than this psalmist. Our help is even closer than the psalmist. Our hope made his way down the mountain, our hope made his way down the mountain to meet each one of us in unique ways. He not only took our place upon the cross, dying for our sin, but rose again on that third day. Upon his death, he tore the veil, the separating veil 
He tore it into the Holy of Holies. Given this powerful access to all who would draw near to Yahweh through Jesus. All of us with our sin, with our stress, and, and with our trouble, we, each of us now, have this great privilege that we can come boldly to the throne of God and find grace, find grace in our time of need. And may we keep our eyes upon Jesus. May we keep our eyes on Jesus as we move forward into the dark days that lie ahead. Sounds kind of pessimistic. You think there's dark days laying ahead. I do. Sorry. I do. But the light of the world is in us. Right? So, although it may be dark... We have the light of Christ and light and life of God dwelling in us, right? That's powerful. It's powerful. We need to lean on this. And I, I know I'm stating the obvious and the, what you already know, I'm preaching to the choir of sorts, but I want to re-encourage you guys to realign and keep your eyes fixated on Jesus. And may we constantly First, look to our God for help. I struggle with that. I admit it. I, I told my, my church last week, I, I struggle with this. I, I have problems, and, and I want to go to my close friends, and I want to go to Google, because Google seems to have the answer. And I, I want to I I go to everywhere but my God. And, and I need to just get alone with the, with the Lord and, and go to my own Jerusalem and wait for the power on high to come. Right? And I encourage you with that to put your eyes on Jesus, to, to look for him for help, knowing, verse 3, that he will not let you stumble. The, the one who watches over you will not stumble indeed. He who watches over Israel never stumbles or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you and I, right? So our God not only meets us in our times of trouble, but is able to keep us in our times of trouble and walk us through our times of trouble. He is my provider. He is your provider and sustainer. He's your sustainer, my sustainer when I abide in him. In, in Isaiah 46, 4, the Lord says this to Israel, but, but I believe it's applicable to you and I as his, as his children. It says, I will be your God throughout your lifetime. Until your hair is white with age, I made you. I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. You see, the, the things that we, we look to and trust in, they're always temporary. They, they always expire. Contracts terminate. Earthly relationships grow weary, our end. Resources need replenishing. The, the full tank of gas, yeah, it's full. Man, it runs out. This body decays. You older people warned me about that when I was in my 20s and I didn't believe you. Even in my 30s, I didn't believe you. In my 40s and now pushing 50, it wears out, man. It just bums me out, but it's a reality. No matter how, much, how good of shape you can get in and stay in, it, it just breaks down. It's temporary. It decays. But the love of our sustaining Lord and Savior does not end. I mean, his faithfulness can never be exhausted. I mean, he is, is faithful to the finish. And what he has begun, and you and I, he will finish because he never slumbers. He never sleeps. Now, as Israel recognized and sought after the Lord, he would meet them and he would keep them from stumbling. And all of us, we're prone to wonder. We're prone to stray. I, I wondered and I strayed and I still went to church every Sunday. What? Yeah. I'm prone to wonder as a pastor and stray 
Sorry to admit that to you guys. It's a reality. We're, we're prone to wonder. We're, we're prone to stray and to stumble. And God's grace is more than sufficient, but, but so is his sustaining grace. Okay, his sustaining grace. I love how the New Testament writer Jude concludes his epistle. Then he first he warns, he warns and charges us to contend for our for the faith. He warns us about false teachers. He encourages us to be built up in our faith and to be in prayer and to keep ourselves in, in the love of God. Because it's powerful. God's grace is here, his, his love is here, but I want to walk out here, do my own thing sometimes. There's no guarantees out there. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Oh, but his love and his grace, it draws, it follows me into the darkness. It's powerful. It's rich. It's real. this sustaining grace of, of God. Man, so he encourages us, right, to, to be in prayer, to be stirred up in our faith, to contend, uh, to contend for the faith. But really, it's not us that keeps us. We're not relying upon our own works and our own, own you know, dealings. It's always God who we look to. It's his mercy. But our hope is not in what we're doing. It's in his mercy, right? The one he finishes and he says, now to him, that's how he concludes in Jude. He says, now, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. Man, isn't that beautiful? I think sometimes something happens when we become Christians and we start to follow the Lord. We, we, know, we, we know that we're saved by grace. Oh, man. We know that we are, are saved, that we're saved by grace. We're forgiven from our sin. And it had nothing to do with our own works. But we, for some reason, we start to learn how to walk as a believer. We, we learn how to, to walk out this salvation, you know, and, and we, we learn to walk our salvation, and man, we, we, we kind of have it down, right? We start, getting it, we start getting it down. We take a few steps, and we say, hey, I got this. Man, I, got, I, I, know, I, I know what I believe. I have my systematic theology down, right? I know what I believe. I'm, I'm learning to deny myself, man. I would have gone right into that stuff. Not anymore. I'm learning, I'm learning how to deny myself. Man, it's an amazing thing that happens when you start to learn and to do this and you, and you start to, to grow in your faith. Man. Man, I'm giving my time and my talent and my treasures to the Lord. This is fantastic, right? And when these things are done as a result of the Lord's work in your life, this is certainly fantastic. But when these things are done in our own strength, and by our own efforts, we're eventually doomed to stumble. We're doomed to stumble in either self-righteousness, hey, I got this, right? Or to stumble in exhaustion. I can't keep up. And then other sins ensue. It is by God's spirit that we live, that we grow, and have power and move forward not in our own strength. But we are certain to stumble and to run out of gas. I'll never forget, we went to this conference. Um, it was the first conference I went to when, after the church was planted. And, and uh, Pastor Neil and some of his crew from Destin and, and, um, and me and a couple from, uh, from Navarre. And we jump in the van. We had a rental van, I think. And then we, we were heading down to, uh, to Merritt Island. And Neil drove the the first leg of the, the journey. And then right before, what, if, what, what is that long, uh, that toll that runs east and west off the 95? It goes through Orlando? Yes. Well, we, right before we got on that, 
Neil says, okay, I'm gonna let you drive, Randy. So he, he pulls over. So I hop in the driver's seat and, uh, and we start on that. I don't know if you know this, but there's no gas on that road. Like, like you only, you learn that once and you never do that again, right? And uh, so, and he didn't tell me it's empty and like, I didn't, we were jibber jabbering. It's not his fault. I didn't pay attention either. And, and I, but I, I'm going, hey man, um, I think we're on empty, dude. And uh, it says next gas, 40 miles, right? And it said we could go 35 miles. <laughs> they were like, we're going to test this thing, right? And it's funny because we started with all these jokes, but then it's getting late. No one wants to like be sitting on the side of the road waiting for anyone for the middle of the night, you know, kind of thing. And uh, so as we moved along, it got serious. Like we started going, oh. it went from jokes to we, a Pentecostal van. We were speaking in tongues. It had been a little bit in. You know, sit about a Honda, you know, kind of thing. And like, we, we were like, oh, how, man, we are, and we were pretty soon, we had zero miles and we could see the exit up there. And we were just, just coasted in. I think it was like the widow's oil. I think it, God just kept filling the gas tank up, you know, and just gave us a break. You know, it was, here's a little more grace for you guys are just clueless. And so, um, and we coasted in and got gas. But, you know, when you fill the tank up, you're fine. You can go for, you know, your smart car, 500 miles or whatever, but, you know, you, whatever, you could go for a long distance, but, but, it, but eventually you got to fill it up. It's it always, it's this constant in life, this constant. That being said, please, please let me remind you of what you already know. The Lord Jesus loves you so much that he watches over you and he's able to keep you. May, may the Lord Jesus and by his spirit be the gas in your tank. Not the next paycheck, the next relationship, not the next president, not the next whatever, you know? May the Lord Jesus be the gas in your tank because he loves you. He can keep you and I moving and keep from stumbling the sustaining grace of the Lord that I'm learning more and more today so that I, I first depended on him when I was 19, and now I depend on him all the more so that I don't stop becoming the prodigal and graduate and become the elder son. It's God's grace all the way through. May his strength and life be in you. So as we recognize where our help comes from, we keep our eyes on Jesus, verse 1 and 2, and recognize that he sustains and watches over us, verses 3 and 4. Let me encourage you with our last passage, that he also can finish what he has begun in you. Verse, verses 5 through 8, the Lord stands beside you and protects and is your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go both now and forever. His faithfulness is everlasting. He is the author and the sustainer and finisher of this faith that, that you and I have begun. And, and please, let this be a practical reminder for us right now in the middle of whatever you're going through, because I don't know what you're going through. Some of you, some of you guys watching online, you're, I don't know, you're, you're dealing with some crazy stuff. Some of you are, are, have this heavy weight upon you. Some of you are dealing with, well, well, terrible sin that you're struggling with. Some of it, not from your own dealing, but somebody else has, has harmed you and hurt you. Lord, he knows exactly where you are. Whatever you're in the middle of, whatever you're going through, the Lord, he can carry you through it. He can carry it, you through it to the end and beyond the end forever. Now, now the psalmist in the Middle East, to, to the psalmist, the, the sun was this, this life-sucking force and harm. That's why they kept themselves covered up all the time. It just sucked the life out of you and the moisture out of you. And it was this life-sucking force for the traveler. And they also had these great superstitions from the occultic practices around them concerning uh, the moonlight, the moonlight, and the evils that existed in the darkness. 
But if you can recall from Israel's journey out of Egypt and into the wilderness, this 40-year journey uh, of Israel's desert experience, I think the psalmist is drawing from that, that familiar history for, for those reading this. The Lord was with them through the entire journey. He was this cloud by day, shading them, bringing shadow, protecting them from the sun. And he was this pillar of fire by, by night, casting away any evil that was lurking in the darkness. Oh, and those other nations, they saw this pillar of fire, and they're like, whoa, what kind of God is that, you know? And, uh, and so he's reminding them of God's faithfulness there. He wants those who, who trust in the Lord to know that nothing either of the day or night can harm us if God is keeping watch. That, that God is our covering against every, every calamity imaginable. That he is our shade against the visible dangers of the day, as well as the, the hidden hazards of the night. Now, verse 7 in the New Living Translation reads that the Lord keeps us from all harm and watches over your life. I, I, I'm not crazy about that rendering. I, I like the New King James Version for this verse better, carries the context of God's word better, and it reads, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. Because let's, let's face it, while we are, you know, uh, walking through, living our lives out in this falling world, the rain will fall on the righteous and unrighteous alike. Bad things will happen to everyone. It's a reality. We, we will certainly witness and experience loss in this life as well as, as many other painful events. But we can know and we can rest assured that the Lord will preserve us from all evil and preserve our soul. There's an eternal matter. But while we're moving through whatever calamity we must, we must face. And Jesus is our Savior, but he is also our faithful friend. The Lord said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And what I love the most here is the longevity of our God's faithfulness. We have friends who will help us for a time. Some of us have great friends like that. They'll, they'll, help, us, they'll help us for a time when we, when we need it. And we even have those who may help us for an extended period of time, for years even. But who can guarantee a lifetime? No one. No one but the Lord Jesus can make this promise and say, from this time forth and even forevermore, I will preserve you. I will keep watch over you. We try everything in our own demise to our own demise. I think it was uh, Walt Disney, where I went to Bible college, California, we used to drive by this building where they said Walt Disney was frozen, cryogenics. He thought he was going to preserve himself there, right? So someone accidentally pulls the plug or whatever, you know, then he melts. But like, but you know, I mean, but we try everything to preserve our lives, to eat right and, and, and exercise right and to take this drug and that drug and to not take this drug and that drug. We do, we do everything to kind of preserve ourselves. But we can't. But God can preserve your life and he can preserve you for eternity. As what Pastor Neil said, well, this is not home. We're simply passing through. Now, please stand with me, if you will. Paul began, Paul began an encouraging letter to the church in Philippi. He began with something that I really I wanted to close with today. He wanted them and really he wants us to know that he who has begun a good work in you, in me, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And, and, and that day, my friends, the day of Jesus Christ, when he comes, we're raptured or he, or he 
or we pass on and go to be with him. That day in Jesus Christ, it's just the beginning for us forevermore, right? It's the beginning forevermore. You know, the Lord knows what, what you and I are facing individually. He knows you well. I want to encourage you with that. You're not shocking him or surprising him. He knows you, he knows you well. He knows me well. He knows what we're facing. He sees the world in its treacherous wobble. And, and, and please know this, he holds each of our worlds in his hands. He is that rock we can stand upon. He is the, the way that we can follow the truth that can be trusted, the life that is everlasting and our help in every time of need. May we keep our eyes on Jesus knowing that he will sustain and keep us forever. And, and guys, before we, we, we come and remember our Lord's great sacrifice upon the cross, and Pastor Joe, I think his first service is going to walk us through it. Before we come to the table and celebrate, really, remembering, reflecting, let's go to the Lord. And I want you to bring your, your problems that you have. If you haven't done it in the beginning, I want you to bring them to the Lord. Your sin, the sin that you're dealing with, that's plaguing you, that's, that's dragging you behind, that's, that's disqualifying you maybe, give it to the Lord. 